Welcome to our discussion on the rank correlation test. Now, um, most introductory statistics classes um, only talk about what are called parametric tests, which is kind of a shame because there's a lot of data in the world that are non-parametric, and we'll talk about what that means in a second. This is one example, one simple example of a non-parametric test that anybody can uh, run. So I like to discuss it even in an introductory class um, for those cases where you do have data that needs this type of test. So in previous lessons we've looked at paired sample data and we tried to come up with a linear correlation coefficient r to determine if uh, those two sets of data were somehow related. Well in, in this lesson um, we're going to use ranks as the basis for computing uh, the correlation coefficient r sub s. And the s does not refer to standard deviation. It's actually kind of a nod to Charles Spearman, uh, the guy who came up with the idea of rank correlation. So let's define some things. First and foremost, a rank correlation test, which is sometimes called a Spearman's rank correlation test, again, trying to honor the guy who thought of it, is a non-parametric test that uses ranks um, of matched pairs to test if there's an association between the two variables. Now I mentioned parametric and non-parametric. Parametric tests are tests that have some sort of requirement about the nature or shape of their distributions, right? the, the populations that the data comes from. Normally those requirements are that you're sampling from a population that is normally distributed, or you take a large enough sample to kind of uh, overcompensate for it not being perfectly normal or close to normal. Well, non-parametric tests don't require those types of things. They don't um, require that your samples come from normally distributed populations or any other uh, particular type of uh, distribution. They, they have less stringent requirements on those things and so because of that they're oftentimes referred to as distribution free tests instead of non-parametric tests because non-parametric is a little misleading. It makes it think it makes it seem like you're not measuring something based on a parameter. Remember a parameter is a statistic from the population so the mean and the median and things like that that come from the actual population. But that's not true because some parametric tests are based on the median, for instance. But parametric and non-parametric are still the, the most popular uh, phrasing, and that's what you'll hear uh, these things referred to as most often. Okay, some more definitions. Uh, in order to do uh, this rank test, the first thing you have to do is you have to sort your data. right? So when your data is all sorted, i.e. arranged in uh, in some order, usually um, smallest to largest or you know best to worst, just depends on how you want to quote unquote rank them, right? sort them, um, then you assign a rank, a number, to um, each item in your sample. The first item is going to be uh, given a rank of one, the second a two, and so on until the last one. So you always rank them um, from one to n, n being the, the size of your sample. And if two things are the same, uh, you know, equally best or equally worst, or you were trying to rank scores or something and two people tied, then you still um, rank them in order. It's not like you go three, three, and then move on to four, because the third and, and fourth one were the same, you would rank them three, four, and move on. And so even though they had the same number, they would have two different ranks. And then you deal with those ties later. We'll get onto that in a second. Okay, some of the advantages of uh, rank correlation is we're able to analyze uh, paired data that are ranks or things that could be converted to ranks. And oftentimes you'll have data that aren't numerical. And so you can't do the normal uh, you know, linear correlation that you're used to, you have to do this kind of ranked correlation. And the other big uh, advantage is that it does not require that normal distribution for your populations. That's a big thing. Um, and then another key advantage is that oftentimes rank correlations and other non-parametric tests are able to detect some relationships that aren't linear. If you have a relationship between two variables that isn't particularly linear, and remember we always want to do our scatter plots first just to get a picture of what's going on with our data. When you see something that isn't linear, sometimes you can detect that relationship using a non-parametric test. Not always, but sometimes. Okay, the disadvantage 
um, it's a very small disadvantage is that rank correlation has an efficiency rating of 0.91. You're probably thinking, what the heck is an efficiency rating? Well, an efficiency rating um, is basically a way of comparing um, one test to another. So if all other circumstances are equal, the non-parametric approach of doing rank correlation would require 100 pairs of sample data to achieve, uh, to achieve the same level of you know, accuracy as only 91 pairs of sample data would be um, through normal uh, parametric methods. So all that means is you need a slightly larger sample to get that same level of accuracy from a non-parametric test, um, in this case rank correlation, to um, a parametric version, regular correlation, right? Your regular um, uh, correlation coefficient of R. So that's a that's a pretty weak disadvantage if you only need you know nine more pairs of data. Okay, what's the objective of this test? Well, it's the same objective of, of any correlation. We're trying to figure out if there's an association between two variables, in this case, ranked variables. So we're going to have the same uh, null and alternative hypotheses. The null is going to be, um, in this case, rho sub s for, again, that, that Spearman, right, not standard deviation, and rho, remember, is your, your r from the population, that there is no correlation, so your rho equals zero, and then your alternative is that rho doesn't equal zero, meaning that there is some sort of correlation between the two variables. Some of our notation, r sub s, we've already talked about that, that's the correlation coefficient for our um, paired data. Rho sub s, that's the correlation coefficient from the population, or it's the thing that we're trying to basically guess at from our sample. n is going to represent the number of pairs, because just like all correlation, you have to have paired data. And then d is going to represent the difference between the ranks of two values within an individual pair. And we'll go through an example and you see what that means. Think about it this way, as if you were trying to compare um, uh, the length of someone's uh, foot to their height, which we know has a pretty strong correlation, then if you looked at per the first person and took their height and subtract the length of their foot from it, that would be the difference between those two values from an individual pair. Okay, requirements. The paired data are simple random samples. You know, we always kind of have that requirement that we're taking simple random samples. And the data are ranks or can be converted into ranks. Duh, how else can we do ranked correlation unless we're dealing with ranks? Um, special note, right? Unlike the parametric methods, there is no requirement that these pairs of data have a bivariate normal distribution. And there is no requirement of a normal distribution for any population. So it, it doesn't matter where you're getting this data. It doesn't have to come from normal distributions, <coughs> normally distributed populations, which is a huge advantage. Okay, our test statistic. The first thing you have to do is convert all your data into ranks, then you calculate your R sub S, which seems rather complicated, but it's a pretty easy formula. Uh, you know, these aren't very complicated things. N is just your number of pairs, right? And then you're summing up your X and Ys, the each number from each pair, right? And then your sum of your X's, your sum of your Y's. You can see these are all pretty basic things to co uh, compute. You could do it very easily in a simple spreadsheet. Of course, technology will oftentimes do this for you. Um, and then remember that you have to have no ties. All right, so after the converting the data into each sample to ranks, if there are no ties at all among your ranks, meaning you didn't have any data right with the same numbers, so you didn't have any, any ties amongst uh, your ranks, then the exact value of your test statistic, your RS, is, is here, which is very simple. 1 minus 6 times the sum of the differences squared, right? Take each difference and square them and sum them up all over n times n squared minus 1. Again, very simple stuff. Technology can do it for you. And we'll talk about what to do when we do have ties here in a second. Okay, p-values, right? We're always trying to compute p-values. Sometimes we can find them using technology, um, provided the technology you know, has the ability to do this. Uh, sometimes you can look them up in tables. Um, it just depends on the situation, but usually technology is the way to go. Critical values, well if your n, right, if your number of pairs is 30 or smaller, oftentimes you can find critical values in tables. 
However, if your uh, uh, number of pairs, right, your n is bigger than 30, you usually have to use a formula to find your corresponding critical value. And the formula, down below, very simple, it's just plus or minus z over the square root of n minus 1. And the z is just the corresponding z-score that you get from your normal z-tables. And you just have to figure out, um, you know, the z is always based on whatever your alpha is. If you're testing at a 0.05 um, level, then your z is 1.96. If you're testing at a 0.01, right, then if, off the top of my head, I think it's like 2.56 or something like that. But you look it up in a table. It's very simple. Okay, kind of the uh, flow chart of what we do with these tests. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, are the pairs of data in the forms of rank? If they aren't, we convert them. Right? So then we can now come down here and say, yes, they are. All right, does either variable have ties among the ranks? Uh, no, then we can calculate the difference by subtracting right, one from the other, square those differences, add them all up, calculate this thing here. If there are ties among them, then we have to use this more complicated formula. And then we get down here where we ask ourselves, right, so from both of these formulas, we got an RS, right? When there weren't any ties, we got an RS here. When there were ties, we got an R sub S here. So now we're at the step of what do we do once we have that R value? Well, if N is less than or equal to 30, right, then we can find our critical values using a table. If it isn't, then we can use uh, find our critical values using this simple formula. In either case, once we have that, we can now compare, right? All we're doing is asking, does the RS that we computed, is it between the negative and positive values, or does it fall outside? It's back to that simple idea of, does our test statistic um, fall in our rejection regions or not? So I'm going to draw a picture of our good old friend the normal curve even though remember with these types of tests things aren't necessarily normal but basically the same thing is happening from either um, you know this formula or the table we end up getting a, a plus and minus we'll call it RC for R critical right we get those critical values and they denote our rejection regions and then from either this one or this one, we get R sub S. And if R sub S lands here, right, it's between the negative and positive, then we fail to reject. However, if R S is not between, meaning it landed either in here or in here out in the tails then it's in the rejection regions and we reject our claim so that's all we're trying to say with this verbiage is what we're we're used to we're comparing our, our test statistic to our critical values because oftentimes you know getting those p-values are difficult okay let's look at an example so the list below lists quality rankings and prices of 37 inch LCD TVs we want to find the value of the rank correlation coefficient and use it to determine if there is a correlation between quality and price. We're going to use the 0.05 alpha significance level. And then based on those results, we're going to figure out, does it seem like um, you, know, you get better quality if you spend more? All right, let's uh, go through our requirement check. We assume we have a simple random sample. We've got our normal hypotheses of there is a correlation or there isn't. Right? In this case, obviously, the null is no correlation. Now we're going to um, convert everything into ranks. So here's our original data down below to remind us what's going on. And that's our first row, right? It's just the 1 through 7. And then these numbers here, we just rank them. If you look, OK, with the smallest number, the smallest uh, number for uh, the prices, right, is this one, 1,200. So there's my 1. Then 1,300, 1,400. Then it looks like it jumps up to 17, right? 19, 2 grand, and finally 2700. And that's where this row of numbers comes from. 
and we didn't have any ties, right? And by ties, it would mean like if these were both 1300. If these were both 1300, you would still do one and two, and then we would deal with the ties um, accordingly. And I'll show that on the next slide. Now that we have our two ranks, we calculate the difference, simply just this one minus this one, right? This one minus this one, you'll notice that they're always positive. You always do positive uh, differences. 3 minus 2, 6 minus 4, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. there's all your differences. Then you square them. All right. Now, if we had ties, like I said before, uh, there's a certain thing we have to do with ties. So if we were trying to um, look at these numbers, and given ranks of these uh, ranks, this is where those ranks come from. So we order our numbers from smallest to biggest, right? Our sample, four, five, five, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just rank them one through, in this case, eight, because there's eight numbers. And you'll notice that in the very beginning, you end up getting three numbers with three different ranks, right? We have three, three fives, and they get ranked differently. And then the two twelves also get ranked differently, which doesn't seem fair, and it isn't. So what you do, very simply, is you just take the average of your ranks. 4 plus 3 plus 2, right, is 9. 9 divided by 3 is 3. And so now they all have the same rank of 3. So it's not like in sports where um, they all would be ranked second, right, 2, 2, 2, and then this one would jump to 5. That's what you do in sports. We don't do that here. We do it this way. Statistics, a little different. And then the last two, right, you average 7 and 8, and they both get 7.5. Okay, so that's all you have to do to handle ties. It's not too difficult. Okay, now if we had ties, of course, we would have to use um, the more complicated uh, formula, but because we didn't have ties, we could just use the differences. So we take the differences, throw it into this simple formula, calculate everything out, and there is our R. This is the same R you would get from technology if you were running a normal correlation coefficient. All right, this is your correlation coefficient, more or less. This is your 0.429. Then we can go to a table and we can find the critical values of 0.786. So I'll draw the picture. Again, remember, it's not necessarily um, a normal curve, but it's what we're used to kind of seeing. So this is negative 0.786, and this is positive. 0.786, and those are our rejection regions. And then where does 0.429 land? Well, it lands right about there, which is not in either rejection region. And because it doesn't fall between this, we fail to reject, which means we're more or less right stuck with our null, which means there is no correlation. So there is not sufficient evidence to support a claim of a correlation between quality and price, right? There wasn't enough information to push us off of the null and and accept the alternative. We're you know we're kind of forced to stay with the null. So there's not sufficient evidence to support a claim of correlation based on the given data. It doesn't right. It doesn't appear that you necessarily get better quality by paying more. And that's it, guys. It's that simple. Um, one more example I want to talk about very quickly is the idea that um, rank correlation can sometimes find relationships that are not linear. So if we had data like this and we uh, put it in a scatter plot, we could see uh, very quickly that we have kind of an S shape. But we definitely don't have a linear. I mean, if we got rid of that one and got rid of that one. We kind of have a linear there. Now if we try to find uh, a correlation between these uh, two sets of data with a linear correlation, we wouldn't get a great result. We would get an R of 0.59, which is a pretty weak, weak correlation. And we would have critical values of 0.632, which would suggest that there is not a linear relationship between x and y. And it's kind of obvious from the graph that there really isn't a linear correlation between those two things. It looks like there's an S-shaped correlation between those two things. And by doing um, 
a non-parametric test, not necessarily a rank one, but there are many other ones out there. If you do a non-parametric um, test on that data, you can actually get an R of 1. You can get a, a fairly perfect correlation, right? Um, and then, say, with, the, uh, with a, a slightly different critical value, that there is, in fact, a correlation between X and Y. <clears throat> so, with rank correlations, as stated before, one of the big things is we can sometimes, I'm sorry, not with rank correlations, well, with all non-parametric, but with rank correlations as being one of the type of non-parametrics out there, we can sometimes detect relationships that are not linear. All right, have fun.